All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by John, a.k.a. Last Coin Standing. He's an avid Bitcoiner and educator focused on Bitcoin's second order effects. He's a product management leader at MasterCard with 20 years of experience in consumer internet and financial services. And John writes extensively on Bitcoin, particularly exploring how loyalty and merchant offers can drive Bitcoin's usage as a medium of exchange. He has a strong background in user research, metrics, and business strategy, and is an advisor to SetSpec, a European Bitcoin rewards company. Welcome, John. Uh, I'm super excited to have you on. Thanks, Bram. Happy to be here. I should just mention, I, I left MasterCard last month, so I'm not, I'm not still there. Uh, so. Maybe we'll get to that. Is Bitcoin the reason? <laughs> or uh... <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Very, okay. very keen to focus on Bitcoin-related stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well... You know, I don't want to guess your age, but I will assume you are a Gen Xer. Like, how how Correct. do you experience talking about Bitcoin with your generational peers? Yeah, I'd say it's mixed. I'd say um, there's definitely a very small subset of my friends and family, immediate family and extended family, who have an interest in Bitcoin. Most um, they're they're not so interested. Um, and I definitely see more of an interest from the younger generations. Um, I certainly have managed to orange pill a handful of my close friends though, and family because uh, you know, we spend a lot of time together and uh, they're willing to put up with me talking about Bitcoin for longer than, than most people. Yeah. So how did that go? What, what was, the, was it a big challenge or what was your angle there? Sure. I think it's a big challenge. Like, just like anything, I think you have to start with the problem. You have to recognize that there's a problem before talking about this solution. And I think that many people, uh, actually, it's kind of come up in the last year or so, but um, we used to try and orange pill people by getting people to buy Bitcoin. But I think the much smarter approach now is to focus on getting them to learn about Bitcoin and more fundamentally to learn about money. What is money? Because I think yeah. if you don't understand the question, what is money, uh, you can never really get to the point where um, it's, it's like Bitcoin is very much a kind of a second order from uh, that foundational understanding of uh, what is money and, and why our current money is, is broken. And once you know it's broken, then then you can start looking for, for a solution to that. And, and Bitcoin very much is the solution. And in my mind, it's the only solution. Yeah. And I also wanted to ask, like, did you ever talk about Bitcoin with your colleagues? Like... <laughs> wink, wink. I did. I I, How did that I go? Ta- I did. I, I talked with them. Um, I mean, certainly some of my close colleagues at uh, uh, MasterCard I've, I've had conversations with. And um, I think it's funny as well because my laptop uh, in meetings is covered with Bitcoin stickers. And of course, it's the only one like that. And, and um, I, I do mention Bitcoin from time to time in, in meetings. And, <laughs> um, but I, I think like like many uh, like like a lot of um, legacy um, or tr- uh, traditional might be the more benign name, but like a lot of legacy or traditional uh, financial institutions, I, I think for better or for worse, they don't really have um, much of a role to play in Bitcoin, and I think it's very difficult to reimagine any component of their business model um, to have a successful Bitcoin strategy for, for better or for worse. I think a lot of these institutions are uh, very much tied to the fiat system. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a challenge. And I, I think it's one of the reasons um, I've been, like I've, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist class of 2017. Uh, so I've worked, um, I have a MasterCard the last 10 years. Um, but I think um, now, uh, now that I'm no longer at MasterCard, I'm, I'm sort of in a better position to uh, focus more on Bitcoin-related stuff. Uh, uh. Yeah. Well, I think we'll get to, you know, MasterCard and financial incumbents. I'd love to talk about that, like what your views sure. on, on that. Um, yeah. Well, you said Bitcoin class of 2016. 2017. Yeah. 2017. So how did you encounter Bitcoin? And, you know, obviously operating in in a TradFi world were there any like beliefs that held you back in understanding it when you first encountered yeah. it yeah yeah i i think the the biggest impediment that i had is that unfortunately i have a degree in economics um so i have a degree in business and economics from trinity college dublin i grew up in dublin ireland uh, and, and that was very much a liability because you, um, you're you sort of mired in all these Keynesian ideas and um, modern monetary theory that uh, we certainly never learned what money is from first principles. Um, 
and like I touched on earlier, that is really the foundation by which you start to appreciate why Bitcoin is really interesting and a solution to a very big problem. Um, the, the first memory I have of encountering Bitcoin that I, I, I have as a memory was around 2012 or 2013, where I remember I was in Palo Alto, California. I live in California now. And um, I was with my close friend, Nick, and he pointed out uh, that like, oh, this um, coffee shop um, um, takes Bitcoin. They support Bitcoin. And I remember just rolling my eyes and, and quickly changing the conversation to something else, because in my mind, um, I just assumed Bitcoin was some fad or some gimmick or some monopoly money. And um, I had no, no time for it. And I think um, there's another saying in Bitcoin that we sort of have to be tapped on the shoulder about three times or have three contacts with Bitcoin before we start asking those extra questions and starting getting start getting more curious. So, uh, so yeah, I, un unfortunately, I didn't take it seriously. Um, but I think one thing I, I have, and I think many Bitcoiners have, if not all Bitcoiners have, is that we do have an intellectual curiosity. So at, at some point, um, and in my case, it was around um, 2017, I started to ask more and more questions because I, I guess it was probably the the price I noticed that earlier in the year, Bitcoin was at about $1,000. And then by about, I think, March or April, it was at about $3,000. So that was very interesting. And um, at the time, also, unfortunately, there was a lot of like all coin stuff going around. And I remember just sitting down and starting to just just go on that sort of intellectually intellectual curiosity journey to to learn more so and of course then it's as we all know it's a it's a rabbit hole the more questions we get answered the more additional questions we have and and um and it's it's just so intellectually stimulating that i think a lot of us just keep going and and it, it's a never ending journey and it's, yeah. it's it's a wonderful journey hey there i want to ask you for a quick favor I noticed something interesting. 75% of my viewers aren't subscribed yet. Subscribing helps me grow this channel, ensuring more great content each week. So if you're enjoying our conversations on Bitcoin for Millennials, please consider hitting the subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your favorite podcasting app. I'm super grateful for everyone who already joined and shared their thoughts. Your feedback really keeps me going. And I want to ask you to continue doing that. I try to respond to all the comments and also the emails that I get. Uh, and DMs on Twitter, etc. So don't stop doing that. I'll keep going. Now let's get back to the conversation. I think it's so interesting when you say like, and, and you probably look at it differently now, right? But then like your friend points out like, hey, this store takes Bitcoin and you just roll your eyes. It's probably the opposite of how, how you look at the world now or how you, how you sure. think, right? Like Absolutely. What do you think that is? Because like, if I would have to translate it, especially like I also have TradFi uh, experience at, at, at two big banks, right? Like, and, but fortunately, I was already in Bitcoin. So I, I kind of saw it already. But I can imagine for you, like as a, as a, as a career in this, right? You, you see this and you roll your eyes. It's, it's, it, it, is, it is hubris in a sense, right? Like, what do these geeks know or whatever, right? Well, where maybe now you would see it more as a signal, like, oh, it's interesting that someone accepts something different than dollars, for example. Why is that, right? And then you trigger yourself into into learning. But yeah. Yeah, I think it's, there's a, it, I, I touch on this notion in uh, one of my writings, the Bitcoin migration around, I think it's one of the books by Malcolm Gladwell, Blink, where, um, us um, human beings, we, we often dismiss things um, and it's a kind of a good um, natural behavior because um, a lot of things, like we have to focus our attention on certain things and, and Bitcoin to me at that time just didn't seem worthy of my attention. Um, and of course, there's an opportunity cost to that attention. So it means that you're focused on other things that you think are more important going on at, at, the, at, at the time. So I think that's the sort of rationale. I think um, Saylor echoes this point as well, where when he first encountered Bitcoin and for many years subsequently, um, he didn't really focus much on Bitcoin because um, he didn't, that there wasn't a particular problem going on in his business that warranted his attention on Bitcoin because he sort of assumed that inflation was 2% and that's just fine and you just deal with that. But uh, once he realized it was much more than 2%, uh, then he realized it was a problem and that was a problem that needed a solution. And that's when you start to pay a bit more attention that when 
it, like Bitcoin is one of those things in your list of things to check out. And then you, you start to pay more attention and you start to dig deeper. Yeah. So when you start started paying attention you were probably full on in like the ico uh, <laughs> wave also with all the trash like what made bitcoin click for you eventually i mean a lot of people say you have to shitcoin before you bitcoin right like yeah uh, i, I think yeah. that's very true and um un unfortunately that was my case as well i i think um it's this also um gets back to sort of um basic human intuition where when I encountered Bitcoin, I sort of, I, I start to sort of um, position it in my brain relative to other things, not just traditional finance, but other crypto assets, as we say. And um, I start to categorize Bitcoin alongside other things. So my assumption was the at the time was like, oh, Bitcoin is this large or first uh, successful crypto asset, um, but there are these other things. And so Bitcoin is part of this larger universe. And and I think nine times out of 10, that sort of thinking is logical and it makes sense and it's very helpful. But unfortunately, Bitcoin is that one time out of 10 where it's it's a complete waste of time. And um, you can you can spend your thousand hours um, exploring all coins, um, but it will really not yield any insight. And I think um, I made a mistake of reading that book, um, Crypto Assets by um, Chris Bernsky, um, which also unfortunately seemed very logical, like, like oh, there's... Um, crypto tokens and there's crypto utilities and um, mm. there's crypto platforms. But um, ultimately, um, I recognize that um, Bitcoin is attempting to be the new global money. And that use case is somewhere between 300 and 800 billion, 800 trillion. Um, and that's really, and it's a money, it's a winner take all scenario. And um, so it, it took me a while to realize that, um, um, Bitcoin is is the most interesting problem in this whole space, and I I even wonder if if there is any space beyond Bitcoin. I, I think the only other asset that I think plays a role right now that I think is sustainable into the medium term is perhaps um, stable coins. I mean, fiat stable mm -hmm. coins. They're for better or for worse, they're still useful in this fiat denominated world. Um, but I, I think money is something that converges on one ultimately, and I think a second best money in the grand scheme of things really has no role to play over the long term. Yeah. Well, so that obviously takes a time, some time to understand, right? It does. Uh, it does. I mean, for me, I think it was the same, like the, the, the entire technology dimension, right? Like if you look at it just from a technology perspective and something comes along that says, you know, this is faster or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. you'll be like, oh yeah, oh, faster is better, right? Like this is a better mousetrap. I'm going to follow, I'm going to follow that one. Right. Like, you know, so that takes some time, obviously. Like, were there any, um, any things that you learned or, or, or took from your experience working at MasterCard that, that helped you in understanding that this was the only thing or was it more a burden? Yeah, I don't think so, to be honest. I, I think it comes back to um, really, uh, well, so one of the things I did is I read a couple of books on on money and uh, that, that was very useful as a foundation. And in fact, one book I recommend that I, well, that I got a lot of use out of, if I were to pick one, it's um, um, Money, the Unauthorized Biography by Felix Martin. Um, that, that, I found that very useful. And it's, it's not a book I hear uh, much from Bitcoin circles. Um, but it's really then taking, starting from that foundation, I really, f I realized that uh, looking at all of the key um, attributes or, or characteristics of what make an ideal money, um, it was a really profound experience to realize how Bitcoin uh, really satisfied all of these criteria in a way that no money ever has. And it, maybe it's worth touching on a few of those because I do think they are interesting. Um, I mean, money is really a a ledger, like a ledger of economic energy or monetary energy. And that's all it is. It's, it's very foundational. Um, and certainly when we think of the, the characteristics that make an ideal money, um, I think absolute, the concept of scarcity is, is very, is very important. I think that's the sort of corner point, um, uh, cornerstone of a, of a good money. And certainly that's why we see certain monies like gold take, take a very, um, 
uh, significant uh, role over the last several thousand years. But then, of course, with Bitcoin, we have the concept of absolute scarcity, which is something that has never existed before. And taking it further, like it's almost two separate points, is the concept of then digital absolute scarcity. Because even if you had, say, some magical gold that was absolutely scarce and you couldn't mine any more gold, it still would be somewhat impractical for um, global trade in, in the modern world where everything works on internet time and so forth. So so the fact that it's, it's not just... Um, uh, absolutely scarce, but it's uh, digitally scarce um, or digitally conservative. That that's also a first in the human race. That is is really profound, and I think Sailor has talked a lot about that. Um, another concept is the fact that Bitcoin has no issuer, and this is of course a problem with all these other altcoins that come around because they they do have an issuer. They're they're pre mined. Uh, they have a team working on them, and, and Bitcoin really stands alone in that. It's uh, it has no issuer. It's the first true commodity money. Um, it's the first um, bearer instrument over over distance. So this is a it, it, this is a difference with with fiat money, where really when when I send money um, to a friend on the other side of the world, um, it's it's just a exchange of a promise or or, or an IOU. It's not a final settlement in real time. And even when you have like um, dollars or euros in your in your hand, it's it's really not a bearer instrument. It's just it's just a kind of a funny money. It's more better described as a nation state plaything in, in, in a way than what has been uh, the concept of money over millennia. Um, could, wait, that, sorry, could, could we zoom in on that a little bit? Because obviously, you know, uh, lots of people say like, oh, Bitcoin can't be money because it doesn't have enough transactions. Something like MasterCard has this and that many transactions, right? Sure. But I think the understanding of final settlement is super important here, right? Absolutely. Um, if, if Bitcoin is a base layer for money, I don't know who said this. I saw a talk by a guy who said like Bitcoin is layer one and layer zero is the mining, right? The layer layer zero, sure. the mining where it's created. And you have yeah. layer one of the network. Yeah. And then on top of yeah. that, um, layer, layer other two, layers sure. will be will be built. Sure. Right. Yeah, but I, layer I zero think... is the uh, sorry, wait. Layer zero Go is the it. final settlement, right? And because yeah, if I you build right. on top of that, you have to follow the rules, right? But if people compare it to MasterCard, which is probably like a layer seven or something, right? Sure. In the fiat world. Like, can, can you explain that uh, a bit? Yeah, I think um, like a, I think it's an interesting concept to think of layer zero as mining and maybe layer one as the uh, settlement layer. And then layer two, I think, is probably well described as the payments layer. Um, and then maybe layer three beyond that is more um, like, I guess, secondary payments layers and um, payment layers. Um, yeah, I think like really when we're trading, when, we're, when we have a, a uh, I don't want to pick on MasterCard, it could be Visa or American Express or any credit card yeah. transaction or debit card transaction that um, really there, there is not um, final settlement. Um, and this is implications for both the merchant side and the consumer side, but in particular, the merchant side. Because then you have concepts of like um, chargebacks or, or fraud um, that are very expensive and have very significant material cost. And most consumers don't really think that they're paying for those, those costs. But of course, they are paying for them in an indirect way. Yeah. Um, the service and, and of fee, course, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. and there, of course, there, there's fees with, with credit card, you know, 3% and so forth. So um, in fact, it's, it's one of the very significant tenets of um, what, um, what it really drives me over the net um, and has um, really made me think about um, focusing on Bitcoin full time and working on Bitcoin full time is that with my experience and expertise at MasterCard, and in particular in card linked offers, which I work on um, merch, merchant offers, that um, it opens up um, significant opportunities that in in Bitcoin that are that are not available um, to the uh, fiat infrastructure. This concept of final settlement in real time and users getting their rewards or um, redemption in real time, and both suppliers um, and partners getting the opportunity to be paid in real time. It's it's a real strange concept because we deal in fiat world we deal with this concept of thirty days, sixty days. That mm -hmm. every time you make transactions, that there's sort of a delay bet before um, between when you have to receive payment. So all of those things go away, and you know the concept of chargebacks and uh, fraud also disappear, which is very powerful. So, so that, that if there's one thing I would 
Um, like I, I think the concept of medium of exchange in, in Bitcoin is is often dismissed or it's it's um, relegated to some secondary role that's going to happen down the line after a store of value is sort of um, a use case that is fully occupied. But what I, I think a very important insight I find with Bitcoin is medium of exchange is that it's undeniable that it strips significant costs out of the system. And, and that is a huge factor that is underappreciated. So for merchants who do have the, um, take the opportunity to open up a Bitcoin channel and to move um, some of their business to that channel, they're literally getting a significant competitive advantage versus their peers in, in, their, in their vertical. So that's a, that's a huge um, uh, benefit. And, and one other related benefit I will say is that um, it's, those those benefits are completely independent of the bitcoin price it's not dependent on the bitcoin going up in price so so certainly there and there, there are very good uh additional benefits which i hope to write about very very shortly of course about having a treasury strategy to complement the um merchant's operational strategy um but even if the merchant didn't even like bitcoin didn't believe in bitcoin and converted all of its uh bitcoin receipts uh, to fiat uh, at the point of sale uh, they would still be stripping out significant costs from their operations. So that's, that, that is a huge benefit. Yeah. So what's your view on, well, you just mentioned it before, but like the adoption of Bitcoin by incumbents like MasterCard or any other financial giant, you just said uh, in the beginning, like they don't really have a role to play. Yeah. I find that super yeah. interesting. You know, they, yeah. they are this layer seven, like how are they going to, yeah, come down I think, or build for transparency. You know, yeah, yeah. There's there's um, a couple of articles I hope to write soon on um, Bitcoin blue ocean strategy and counter positioning, which I think will help answer some of those questions. But I think the most important insight I think uh, related to the question that you answered is that is is really recognizing that Bitcoin is a parallel system. Um, yes. it, it can live alongside uh, the fiat system and it can have interconnections like we see that with the um, Bitcoin exchanges. You know, it's a big business where you're exchanging fiat for, for Bitcoin. But that's really that's really the level of interoperability. And um, I think over the long term, I mean, my thesis is very much that Bitcoin becomes global money over a long enough time line, the timeline. And um, there is there is no role for fiat. Uh, and I know that. Um, people like Sailor have said otherwise, but um, I think that that's maybe a separate conversation. But I, I think, uh, like I touched on earlier, I think there is there is ultimately no role for a um, secondary money um, because the benefits to having a global universal language of, of value um, is just a, a much better future than any future that, that has an ideal money and for some strange reason, um, some secondary money lives alongside. I think that universal language of value is is the more is the more um, likely destination that that we're moving to. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Maybe for like day to day, I also don't know what it's going to look like. But it could be like if there is a new form of fiat ish type money, like a new a new currency backed by Bitcoin, for example, then I could see like see those those two things uh, you know exist together but that could very well be by the way like a usd stable coin um although those yeah, are obviously I think it, created it, it's, by companies <laughs> but yeah yeah i mean th that's an interesting kind of side conversation as well the, the concept i do hear that concept a lot i backed by um for me it's uh it doesn't hold water well, to the packed, extent that um, to that basically right yeah, I mean, the, the nice thing about Bitcoin is that it is a bearer asset. Um, it, it is a bearer instrument uh, with no counterparty risk. And um, I think as we get into second layers like like Lightning or eCash e and uh, federated solutions, then um, you could argue, I mean, those, th those have their own potential points of failure in that. But I think those will always be better than some institution that is is um, claiming that uh, the money is backed by Bitcoin, because we've seen countless um, scenarios through history where that concept of back back by was a promise that that was broken, like in yeah. 1971, where um, the U.S. dollar went off the gold standard or officially went off the gold standard, and and you know times like 19, I guess 34, where we had the 6102 rule where um, 
you had um, the kind of gold um, seizure and so forth. So I think those those promises from the government are backed by, I think will always be trumped by just having a bearer instrument. Um, I mean, the wonderful thing about when you hold Bitcoin is that you hold a slice of the pie, if you will, that and that slice remains exactly the same for the rest of eternity, uh, which is very powerful. And uh, whereas I, I think for any other money that is backed by, um, I think in a hundred years time, there are very, there are risks, potentially significant risks that um, you would you would not have your money anymore, and it would no longer be uh, backed by. Yeah, I agree. That's probably that's probably more um, more probable. Um, I, uh, I you sent me some articles. I read one really long one, but I really liked it. It's called the Bitcoin migration, and um, here you also touch upon you know the the importance of absolute scarcity in Bitcoin. How how does that contrast with, you know, gold and fiat money, and and why is it crucial for an a new or ideal uh, money system? Yeah, I think um, if we look back in the history of uh, monies, and we start with monies like say, be there is monies like beads and um, seashells and feathers, and and we we almost laugh at the concept of those being uh, money, but. Um, really they they were the best money for their period in time in their place in in time and nobody even the smartest people in the world at that time um would didn't have any better idea of of what would make the ideal money so um i think then precious metals came along and they had uh, they were stronger in that very one regard um scarcity um that uh, made them um quite resilient as uh, monies over over time and I think um, I, I think the, the the couple or like the, the the two or three maybe limitations with with gold um, is that of course it does have an inflation rate of about you know between one and two percent, so it's not absolutely scarce. And I think it has like a half life uh, in terms of purchasing power of maybe thirty five years, something like that. And then um, it, it it tends to be centralized because um, from a practicality standpoint, it tends to be. Um, um, located mainly with banks and so forth, and that provides a potential uh, point of failure, and that gets back to the um, 6102 um, law, like in law in um, I think it was 1934, um, where um, FDR did the seizure of gold or the um, re repricing of gold. Um, so, um, and then maybe there's a there's a third one, of course, where, where gold is really impractical as a bare instrument for trade over distance. So while it's very useful as a money um, over over time uh, across distance. It has limitations. I, I think uh, fiat uh, went through. You could argue a kind of a honeymoon period um, where we we did start to use fiat as sort of proxies for for gold, because it sort of over overcame that limitation around trade over distance. So then you can kind of, you had a period where you kind of kind of um, had your cake but could eat it too, where you had. What was a bearer instrument, or what what it, what at least appeared to be a bearer instrument, and you could uh, redeem it at a bank for the full gold value. It was paper gold that you could trade over distance and uh, transport very easily, and so forth. And then, of course, uh, we sort of broke away from that that sort of second stage, um, where now it's it's no longer uh, exchangeable for um, gold. So, which you know really brings us to fiat money, which is quite broken in in so many ways. I think. With Bitcoin now, for the first time, we have um, scarcity that is a very special type of scarcity, um, not just um, not just credibly scarce, but uh, absolutely scarce and uh, digital, which I touched on earlier, which is really profound and really makes Bitcoin um, um, very versatile for global trade, um, in it, given its digital nature and so forth, especially on second layers, of course. Um, but also, um, we, we have very high confidence that like 100 years from now, even a thousand years from now, there will not be any more Bitcoin. So that when you do carve out your Bitcoin position now, uh, you can be confident that you will have that very same share or position even like a thousand years from now, which is pretty profound and pretty incredible. And um, we have never had a money like that. Um, yeah. So recognizing that that scarcity is, is arguably the most important quality of the money and then recognizing that. Bitcoin solves that in a way that has never been solved before and really solves it. Um, you know, arguably it's not, it's not perfect because um, there's definitely scalability challenges still to be overcome. Um, 
and uh, privacy also um, uh, solutions, more solutions that have to come. Uh, but they can come on second layers. And I think there's always progress being made there. So, um, yeah. 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 I, I would argue the same. I think the, the scarcity dimension or the characteristic of Bitcoin is where all the other value actually is derived from not the value in terms of the, 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 the price, but, but as, as to what it is, because if it's provably fine, a provable finite scarcity, you know, then transparency comes from that, right? Because I can say I have Bitcoin, but then you can say, well, prove it, prove it to me. And then I have to, right? There's, there, there's no, there's no way around yeah. that, for example. So yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, are, are there yeah. any other like unique or less discussed characteristics that make it stand out that, that, that are not that mentioned uh, a lot? Like, for yeah. You? Yeah, there are a few, I think. Um, I think another one that's not discussed as much as it should be is the fact that Bitcoin is neutral or non-sovereign. Um, so if you look at, say, reserve currency histories over the years, I think it would be started maybe with um, Portugal and then it was Spain and then it was um, Netherlands, I think, or uh, yeah, and then France and yeah. then the UK and now the USA. Um, so we go through these sort of 80 year periods where we have global reserve currency. But of course, when you look at that history, and in fact, even when you go earlier than that, and you go back to monies like the Roman denarius or the um, florin, uh, which is a very successful currency that lasted for about 400 years and arguably was a significant uh, catalyst for the Renaissance in Italy. Um, even, even those had um, nation state affiliations and um, were therefore um, were thereby also ultimately corrupted and ultimately, whether it's uh, they were de debased with other metals or coin clipped and so forth. Um, so, but yet now with Bitcoin for the first time, arguably, we have a, um, a neutral money, like a really truly neutral money, because even when you think of those gold pieces, they had nation state affiliation to, to some extent. Um, yeah. But Bitcoin is truly new, neutral and non, non-sovereign. Um, the other thing that I found is very interesting is that Bitcoin is kind of global and uh, borderless. Um, so from a financial state standpoint, from a financial trade standpoint, um, when you think of the world now, we sort of take for granted that if you're importing things from other countries, there's foreign exchange fees and there's import fees and so forth. So I think one of the implications of Bitcoin is, is I think it's going to bring the world closer together because um, it will uh, overcome those fees and you can have a truly borderless transaction yeah. uh, in a way that you never could have before. Um, I think what's other also interesting is the fact that Bitcoin is really uh, or organic versus imposed. Like fiat currency really was very much imposed by nation states. It's not, it's not a natural money. It's, I mean, it's arguably not in some ways you can make a very good argument that it doesn't fit um, the criteria of really what is money. It's, and that's why I sometimes refer to it as a kind of a nation state plaything because it is imposed. Whereas um, all other monies throughout history um, were sort of driven in a, in a kind of a grassroots way or organically from, um, from, from the people and people chose those monies. So Bitcoin very much um, falls into that. And I think what's also interesting about Bitcoin as well is that we don't have to um, convince our politicians to adopt Bitcoin. I mean, certainly uh, that will help. And I think there are good efforts underway to try and do some of that, that work. But uh, we ourselves as individuals and companies can government and governments can um, adopt Bitcoin separately, independently by ourselves. And many of us have. Um, so that's another sort of aspect to it that is that is interesting. Yeah. I think um, the fact also that Bitcoin is very much peer to peer, that there are no gatekeepers in the middle. I mean, and that's something that we increasingly recognize in the fiat world. We have cases recently, like I know the war in Ukraine, um, where um, Russian assets have been frozen. And, and really not to say that that's a good thing or a bad thing, but just to recognize that that kind of thing uh, can happen. It uh, really shows that um, fiat money is very much permissioned and, and yeah. similar to what happened with the Canadian um, truckers and that. Um, I think another factor is that um, Bitcoin is very uh, in inclusive. Um, so when you think like there's something like 4 billion people in the world out of, out of the 8 billion that are either unbanked or underbanked. And many of those people can't even get a bank account. Um, they, and even if they do, they have to like they have to go through KYC and AML and so forth. And 
and it's it's just very onerous and um, many of them especially some of the poorest people in poorest parts of the world are unable to do that so bitcoin is the really great great leveler and um it's um it's very in inclusive um which which i think is a very powerful idea um so it, for the first time like um many people in parts of the world can start to save in a way that they could never save before um, so it's very yeah. very powerful i think yeah. um maybe finally um is that um, Bitcoin is like private property on steroids um, because you now have uh, private property that you can walk across a border, um, you can go on vacation and, and it's a one-way vacation and never come back. And so the fact that you can do that um, is is very interesting that um, we, we've never had that before really. Um, and I think one of the implications of that is that we will start to see more capital flight or threat of capital flight uh, in a way that it will help um, make governments more um, responsible in, in, in a way, because if they do start trying to tax Bitcoin, they'll likely find that a lot of Bitcoiners will just move abroad or move to more benign uh, Bitcoin friendly jurisdiction. Yeah, I love I love that 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 uh, I have some uh, some points, but I love that last part. Right. Like if I ask you now, you know, how much Bitcoin do you have? Well, you will probably say I don't have enough, but. You can say, I don't have any. And then I say, well, John, I know you have Bitcoin. And then you say, no, well, I, I don't. And then what? You know, we're at right. a stalemate. You know, I cannot prove right. I cannot prove that you have it. You can also yeah. not prove that you don't have it. So like, yeah, you know, I mean, I who's, li who's lying, it, right? <laughs> I could send it to my relative in a foreign country, really. And yeah. um, no, I, I mean, this, more like yeah. I cannot guess your private key. So if I'm the, sure. the tax person or the government person, and I say, well, John, I know you have Bitcoin. And they say, well, you know, I hit my head in a boating accident and then I lost it. You know, like yeah. there's no, you are sovereign. You, you, can, you can decide Absolutely. on that. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's one of the tremendous um, second order effects, I think, of um, Bitcoin adoption over time is that we will start to see more self-sovereignty, personal agency, uh, which I think is a wonderful trend. And it's a very sort of countervailing trend to what we have seen over the last like two or three decades where unfortunately, like we're sort of like that frog in the, in the boiling pot where there are increasing impositions on us from government to the point where it's now expected that every transaction has to be permissioned by the government or that the government um, should, should know about everything. And I think this is a very good, it's a very powerful force to sort of counteract that over time where uh, we, we will see um, more um, self-sovereignty and, and personal agency in a way that we never would have without Bitcoin. Yeah. And I also think the, the Russia example is good, right? Like the, whatever you think of it, um, you know, if they can do it to Russia, they can do it to you. You know, like Absolutely. I think that's more, the, that's, that's more the point. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, what you said about the neutrality, I think the neutrality is what makes it equal. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if you saw a tweet uh, I shared yesterday. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to publish a little video about it. But if we are going to measure like human productivity in Bitcoin, then it will all. It, it, um, I am still working on how to share it. But like the neutrality of Bitcoin also makes it equal. Right. If we expend the same amount of energy, you and I, you do it in Africa and I do it in Europe, you know, and we do the, ex we built the exact same thing. Then how you are rewarded for that time and energy has a different value than how I'm rewarded. Also compare, comparing these rewards with each other, which is not equal, right? Because we did the exact same work. It's just how we we are rewarded, which, absolutely, you know, uh, in bad, yeah. Uh, how do you say like, um, kills that balance basically that balance in the in the value exchange between the person who who absolutely. delivers a product or a service and the and the and the buyer yeah absolutely i mean it, it's a much more fair money versus the current system we have where uh, there are people in control and when you mention africa i mean of course we know that like a country like like france i think there's maybe 11 or 12 yeah. countries in africa that are still using the french uh, caf currency whatever which is yeah yeah it's i mean yeah, that, that's a rabbit hole currency or something yeah, like that yeah crazy so it's like, based yeah, on the this franc which france yeah. doesn't use anymore for 23 right, years right. it's, it's issued it's by france right 
it's it's crazy. So so they're definitely yeah. uh, like France is definitely extracting a sort of a pound of flesh from that scenario. And I yes. think when we move to the Bitcoin standard, then these African nations will have more sovereignty, and the and the individuals within those nations will have their so, more self sovereignty as well. Yeah, I uh, yeah, a hundred percent agree. And also what you said, you know, like fiat money is forced on you, and Bitcoin is adopted by by you, right? And exactly. What I see is that people don't like these hard words, right? When you say like, oh, this is money you are forced to use and people think like, oh, that's, that sounds crazy or whatever, like they're, they're, they're triggered, right? But it's, it's real. Like, did, did you ever, I mean, you grew up in Ireland and I also grew up in a Western European country. Like, did you ever think about what is money? Like it just worked. You had coins, you went to the bakery, you got exactly. a bread, you're like, okay, exactly. apparently this is it. <laughs> You know exactly. I, I think one of the biggest challenges we face as Bitcoiners and talking to other people is the fact that the current money generally works. It sort of works. Like you go to the store and you can buy everything, and any every merchant will accept the the money in that. Um, I think there is a kind of a uh, apathy um, that that we have um, with our with our current money. But I think we we certainly see in parts of the world like Zimbabwe and Argentina and um, so forth that uh, certainly those people are well aware that where that the fiat money isn't working and doesn't work. And so they, they look for better solutions. And of course, in many of those countries, they look to the dollar because they're still sort of mired in that sort of fiat mindset. And the uh, dollar is like the least dirty shirt in the dirty laundry in a way. Um, but it's still uh, it's still very much suffering from the same debasement as all these other current currencies. And structurally, there is essentially no difference. I mean, the only difference might be that the US um, is the reserve currency of the world, but um, that's just a sort of a flag or a moniker in some ways. And, um, and I think just like we've seen with every other reserve currency of the world, um, that um, position is likely to be usurped by, by Bitcoin. Yeah. By, by the next reserve. Well, but I mean that, that's also why we look why we look at America, right? I had someone ask me last week, like, why do you tweet so much and talk so much about America and finance and stuff? And I, I, I said this, like, I don't yeah. live in America, but it's the same system. Everyone is basically forced to use it, especially like in international settlements, etc. And it doesn't really look that good, right? Like, and so of course I look at that because if America implodes, then I, yeah. we will have the effects here too, undoubtedly. You know, so it, it's yeah, as you said, it's the apex. Yeah, it's the apex currency right now. So yeah, if, I think there's if a phrase that doesn't if, make it. I think there's a related phrase: if the U.S. Um, sneezes, uh, the rest of the world catches it, catches a cold, or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so. If we move towards Bitcoin and and you mentioned medium of exchange, you know, I think mainly, but yeah, I'd love to talk with you about that. Like I see it as, you know, I would say critics say things like the transaction speed and MasterCard, et cetera. But then they say, well, I, I, I thought, you know, Bitcoin was supposed to be money and now people are just hoarding it and they're, they're storing it and they're talking about store value, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And what I say is like, it, it can only be a medium of exchange if it is a store of value uh, before, sure. right? Like it, it, if I'm not exactly. yeah. incentivized to hold it, why would I want to earn it? Yeah. Yeah. I.e. exchange it, right? With yeah. someone else. But like, how, how, how do you see this? Yeah, it's a very big topic. Um, certainly money has three roles um, as a store of value, a medium of exchange and a unit of account. And um, I think it's important that to recognize that those three roles can't be divorced from each other. Like there should be no concept of one money that is a medium of exchange and another money that is a store of value. I think it's a kind of a ludicrous prospect, even though in the short term, I think that's a scenario arguably we have right now where you could say that, hey, um, many of us are, especially Bitcoiners, we're um, hodling and accumulating our Bitcoin and we're spending our uh, fiat. Um, I think a couple of important things to note there is that um, Bitcoiners who recognize the value of Bitcoin and are accumulating uh, Bitcoin, re really the, the reason that we're, we're not spending it is really due down to 
artificial constructs, I would say, of um, taxable event that um, because if we if we were in, say, El, El Salvador, um, there would be no reason not to spend Bitcoin because um, you could just replace it with even if you had fiat income, like you can do the kind of spend and replace strategy without any points of uh, friction. Um, so um, there's no real in, in incentive not to. I think um, that that is really, really the most important re reason. Like when people say that, like, hey, look, people aren't spending their 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 Bitcoin. It's really because of that artificial construct um, and that if we didn't have taxable events, um, we would see much more of a spend and replace strategy. Uh, and I think we, we would hope you mean that's like why a sales I, tax or something or just oh what I, what I what I mean is that like say uh, say there's a local merchant um, who accepts Bitcoin and I'm going to make a hundred dollar purchase um, I could go and make that uh, equivalent hundred dollar purchase in in Bitcoin um, and then buy an extra hundred dollars of of Bitcoin and with that then my Bitcoin stack is the same as it was before um, so that that's that's a kind of an example of it, like a spend and replace strategy, which I think some Bitcoiners are, are, are doing, but they would only do it if they have no um, uh, in in like they've, they've no um, tax uh, tax consequences from doing that. The problem with me doing that in the, in the United States right now, say living in California, is that, you know, anytime you, you do make a anytime you do spend your, your Bitcoin, um, that is like spent like selling a, a oh, stock. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you have yeah, to pay tax. Gotcha. On it. So so yeah. you, you, you start to get hit with that. Um, but in certain countries, like I think, for example, Germany and Portugal, if I'm not mistaken, um, if you hold Bitcoin for one year, um, there are it's it's no there's no longer any uh, taxable events associated with it. So then you overcome that. And I know that if I were in Germany, I'd be um, spending Bitcoin uh, much more than I am now uh, because there would be no taxable events. Yeah. Um, and like I touched on earlier, I think there, it, it, a very key and profound and reason that's not discussed much where I do see Bitcoin playing a role in medium of exchange is, uh, is the fact that it does uh, strip out so many costs uh, from the system. And I, I wrote that article about it. Um, how the uh, Bitcoiner friendly strategy, how merchants can um, uh, employ a Bitcoiner friendly strategy and and really um, uh, strip out a lot a lot of costs from that from that payments channel. Um, one of the key opportunities I do see, and this is where um, this is one of the reasons I'm kind of focused on Bitcoin in many ways, is that when I look at the experience and expertise I got at Mastercard in card linked offers, I, I see a huge opportunity for Bitcoin native offers um, to be a catalyst uh, for driving Bitcoin as medium of exchange. And, and I wrote the, my mo most recent piece on that, the Bitcoin catalyst um, offers as uh, the Bitcoin catalyst of uh, merchant offers. Um, I do see that as a tremendous opportunity and I, I really look forward to working more on some strategies in that area. Because just to, just to um, give a bit of an explanation, um, merchant offers is like card linked offers in the, in the field world is a very powerful marketing tool where you can incentivize consumers to go to certain merchants. And once they make a qualifying spend, which is make, spending a certain amount of, of money um, over a certain threshold um, in, in one or, or more visits uh, in a certain period of time, then they get a reward. They get a statement credit back um, on their credit card or their, or their debit card. And it's a very powerful way to uh, for the merchant to spend their mar their marketing budget um, versus other alternatives. Um, but when you take that into the Bitcoin world, it's actually it almost puts it on steroids and it turbocharges it because you're um, you're you're stri you're not only um, driving all of that loyalty behavior, that spend behavior that uh, repeat visits and um, higher baskets, uh, basket size and attracting new customers, but you're doing so on a low cost payments rail. So you're driving those consumers to the uh, Bitcoin rails, which are far lower cost. Um, and not only doing that for the um, for that particular transaction, but potentially then generating that longer term behavior. So there's a lifetime value associated with that as well, not just higher loyalty from the consumers, from, from Bitcoiners, um, but also um, uh, higher loyalty on those lower cost rails. So I, I think there's tremendous opportunity there. Yeah. Are there any other things that, that merchants merchants should uh, consider when they decide to 
except Bitcoin. I mean, for a lot sure. of people, it's a novelty, of course. And maybe there are sometimes customers that ask for it. I actually have my hairdresser now who accepts Bitcoin. And yeah. the first time I came to him, I paid him in Bitcoin and now he has a sticker. <laughs> so Very that's cool. Great. That's great. But like, yeah, yeah. what are things yeah. I should consider? Yeah, I think, well, look, for the kind of solutions that I hope to to work on, um, I think a, a critical thing to, to note is that this is very much a, this opportunity around um, medium of exchange in particular offers like um, Bitcoin native offers. It's a two-sided market. And those that's where you have to not just uh, attract merchants, get merchants to accept Bitcoin, but you also have to get an audience of Bitcoiners and drive those Bitcoiners to those merchants um, to make it a, a win-win for, for everybody. So that's definitely challenging. I mean, um, building a two-sided a two market business is always challenging. Like some examples would be more like um, Air, Airbnb or uh, Uber or e eBay. Um, you, you have to solve for both sides of the market. So um, so that's so, so for someone like me looking to drive that, that business and hopefully work with other Bitcoiners driving that, um, that, that type of solution. Um, we, we, we have to um, work on some strategies to build out both sides of that, of that market. In terms of the merchant, um, I, I think another key part of their, of their business, um, other than just accepting Bitcoin, there's obviously the uh, related things like making sure there's sufficient li liquidity um, and um, to make sure that all of the transactions come through without, without any uh, friction. Um, I think there's there's also very much a treasury strategy component, and I hope to write about that that shortly. It's not a new idea, but the idea of uh, maybe that's there, there's two parts to that. Uh, one is just the custody part. So if you're a um, Bitcoin merchant and you're accepting Bitcoin and you start you have a Bitcoin channel open up opening up, and you have Bitcoin coming in, the the first problem to solve for is custody. But the second problem then is is a more um, strategic view around well, how do we manage that as a as a treasury reserve asset, and um, and I think there's there's huge potential benefits there as well. I mean, just on that point, I think it was in maybe one of Preston's um, uh, Preston Pish's uh, podcast recently where he covered that um, some some team did a analysis of if you held Bitcoin for a four year period. And they did the, the analysis over the last 15 years that the very worst day, um, if you if you picked the very worst day to start that four yeah. year period, you would yeah. have a 24% a uh, compound annual growth, growth rate, which is extraordinary. Um, and I think the average is, you know, maybe closer to 100% or something like that. And of course, um, past results are no indication of future results uh, disclosure, but uh, but it's still it's, it's a very powerful message um, to at least um, have Bitcoin as as part of one's uh, treasury. So. Yeah. Well, I see. I think it's Square who introduced it now, or Block. That's right. right. That that you can just uh, DCA from uh, your revenue uh, just uh, straight into Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I yeah. think that's super interesting. Instead of the other way around, you know, that will come. I think when yeah. people pay in Bitcoin, but now they pay in fiat, and you just know put uh, x percent of your revenue just directly in bitcoin uh, yeah fascinating chart also the one you mentioned right uh, yeah uh, i'm a big uh, proponent of uh, no trading and yeah. and 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 dca slowly although i'm all uh, all smash no dca but uh, I, I saw that i'm likewise i yeah. saw i saw the graph and uh yeah super interesting approach i, I never saw that before and and you know you don't want to time yeah. the market i think like that's the entire yeah. point Right, you just want to slowly build your uh, your your stack, basically. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I I am I certainly learned some tough lessons there as well. Um, I, I I went through my little little trading phase as well. Uh, yeah. Many of us do. Likewise, <laughs> never doing it yeah. again. No. So how how do you see? Um, or think about it, and I think you briefly touched upon it, but kind of like the psychology of money or what people think is money, how that influences their willingness to adopt Bitcoin as an actual uh, alternative or or a store of value. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I definitely look forward to Bitcoin becoming more normalized. I, I think part of the challenge is that uh, very few people are willing to put the work in 
to understand um, what is money and what makes a good money and why Bitcoin is, is better money and that. I, but I think if it's if it gets to the point where it's normalized and they see their their peers um, acquiring Bitcoin, and to your point, you just touched on like in Square when they have an option like, hey, do you want to keep um, ten percent of your balance uh, in in Bitcoin or when you um, or when when you get paid? Um, and I, I think there's one or two companies doing this. You can get paid in in Bitcoin in that when when that starts to be an option, uh, just like when you go to your four hundred one k and you're asked like, hey, do you want um, which mutual funds do you want or which which um, bond portfolios do you want? Once Bitcoin is an option there, and I think we're starting to see that normalize with the ETFs, then you hopefully start to see pe people take a 5% allocation or a 10% allocation, and it just becomes increasingly normalized. But I think it, it may be a bridge too far um, to expect people to really dig into what is money and why it's a better money and so forth. Um, but, yeah. but that I, they'll hopefully start to see it go up in value and they'll more people will probably start to realize, hey, maybe this this is going to be the future of money and maybe this fiat money is is not going to be the, the future of money. Um, so we'll, we'll see a transition, I think. And I don't know yeah. how long that transition is going to take and how um, steep that S curve is going to be. But I think it will generally ratchet in one direction. And. Maybe one of the things we will see, which I'm generally, it's a theme I'm very excited about in the Bitcoin space, is um, concepts around game theory and jurisdictional competition, um, where we will see certain countries, like we saw with El Salvador, um, take a very significant step to make Bitcoin legal tender. And they're now um, having very significant growth and prosperity and foreign capital investment and um, tourism and uh, much higher safety and security. and. And I, I know not all of that is due to Bitcoin, but I think we will start to see countries take that step to become more fertile ground and benign jurisdictions for Bitcoin, and they will show positive results. And that will then inspire other countries to have to do similar things. And we'll yeah. start to see that sort of virtuous circle. So I look yeah. forward to that. Well, you see that already in America uh, with with the states, obviously, which is which is going to be be interesting. I, I don't Absolutely. think it's any similar than, uh, and I think Sailor mentioned it in his talk, right? Like, why why are the casinos on in Nevada on the border of California, right? Right. So the people from California can come to the casino <laughs> that was Absolutely. not allowed in California, you know. So I think it's like that, and. Um, I'm I'm thinking about what you just said about uh, oh yeah well if Jack Dorsey is listening I think uh, I I had I just had an idea but I, but but like you know we want to show the opportunity that is there you know for for people for merchants in this case to save in Bitcoin and to um, you know get value from this new money system right. Uh, I think it would be interesting if if at Square they could just give reports, right? Like if they say, well, would you want to put 10% of your revenue uh, in Bitcoin? You know, 99 businesses around you are doing it. You know, collectively they, they've they gained uh, XYZ percent yeah. in purchasing power, right? Or similar businesses to you have done this and that, right? Like it's such a, a big opportunity to, yeah, actually I, help, you know, SMB businesses, I'd say. Absolutely. I think one of the... I think one of the big um, catalysts there as well um, that's coming up is that I think um, by the start of next year, we have the um, FASB accounting changes coming in for Bitcoin, where currently Bitcoin is treated as a indefinite intangible from a accounting standpoint, which is mm. very pro prohibitive um, to have Bitcoin on your on your books because you have to uh, account for it at the at its lowest value during the accounting period, which is just crazy. And we know that the um, I forget what FASB stands for, but it's F um, anyway, it's the Federal it's the international. So, something like that, something. Um, but it's it's yeah. very much an official accounting board, and I think they unanimously voted to change the accounting for Bitcoin to be just um, just at its sort of market value, or I forget the exact term, but um, but yeah. it's much more benign now, and it's much more sensible. So yeah. there's no, it's no longer prohibitive to carry Bitcoin on your balance sheet, and of course uh, we'll we'll probably yeah. start to see, you know, hopefully companies like Apple and Amazon and a lot of other public companies then just. Um, uh, carried on their balance sheet and and they they won't need to get special permission i think um like 
No, it's, 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 it's going to be in the standard, right? Like, so the, yeah. the FASB, it's the financial accounting standards yes. board, a private standard yeah. setting body whose primary purpose is to establish and improve generally accepted accounting principles, right? So, yeah. so you're allowed to, to follow that then. Exactly. And I, I think that's yeah. going to be very exciting. Um, so I look forward to that. And of course, even though it, um, it has a bit more of a American influence, a lot of, com a lot of countries in the world follow that. So I think, mm -hmm. um, a lot of other countries will be following the, the, the same standard. Yeah. And so, um, in the, in the article we talk about, you also mentioned the concept of, of demonetization mm. and the shifting of, of monetary. Uh, energy that's now stored in assets like real estate stocks, collectibles, all these things yeah. like to Bitcoin. Can, can you share yeah. a bit about that? Yeah, I think it's really fascinating. Um, th this also is a very large and long topic that's um, very interesting and worth digging into. It's really the concept that um, when we look, when, it, again, it's, it's, it's coming at this from first principles and stepping back and you realize that the fiat money that we've had um, for the last, say, 40, 50 years, it's fundamentally broken because um, the rate of debasement of that money is so significant that we touched on the three roles of money earlier as a store of value, medium of exchange and unit of account. Well, the, the very concept of, um, well, I, I guess a related uh, point there is that money is used as savings, um, as and as also as investment or consumption. That's another three kind of uses of money. But the very use of money as savings um, is really no longer av available with with fiat money, because even uh, the interest rate that you get for a uh, risk free bond um, is really less than the rate of in inflation, and that's even the rest that less than CPI. So the, the concept of savings in fiat uh, does not exist anymore. And, and yeah. with that, um, it's forced people into either investment, the other two, two roles of money, investment or consumption. And in many cases, then it's forced them into what you would term malinvestment or malconsumption. And uh, because savings is no, that sort of default role of money is savings no longer exists. Um, so that's why we started to see um, money flow into what you might call in investments um, that traditionally were never monetized. They were, they were just valued at their use value. So if you go back to say, like focusing on real estate, if you go back to the um, 18th century or even the 19th century, um, houses as a fraction of people's income. It might have been uh, 2x somebody's income or 3x somebody's income. But now it's more like 10x or 11x somebody's income that a house, even though the actual physical nature of the house and the use value of that house hasn't changed. It's because yeah. uh, real estate has become monetized. Um, because So basically it's become the container for monetary energy or economic energy. In it. And that's a role that real estate never played historically. And similarly for um, uh, stocks, um, if you look at certain measures like price earnings ratio, um, just as, as an example, um, which is a typical sort of valuation metric for, for companies, uh, we might have seen valuation uh, price earning ratios before of say 10 to 15 and now it's maybe more like 45 to 50 or something like that even though the fundamental nature of the business hasn't changed so it's also become a container for monetary energy uh, in a way that it never was historically so with with bitcoin we now have um a money that is very much a savings technology as we talked about it so that role of money is now restored and Bitcoin very much um, plays that role of um, uh, savings uh, and investment and consumption. And we will hopefully start to see a reversion away from malconsumption and malinvestment uh, back to savings because we have that sort of third leg of the stool um, playing its its role again. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be interesting. And I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's, it's a very big idea that... Um, tens of trillions of dollars of value in stocks and bonds and real estate and collectibles is going to start flooding into Bitcoin. But I think um, if you really think through from first principles, I think um, this is the reality that's going to happen. Yeah. 
Yeah, 100% agree. I also think the third order effect would be that uh, housing would become more affordable. Again, I look forward to it. Right? Yeah. Uh, there will be a lot of people that that will go through real or psychological pain you know, yes. to get there. Um, but yeah, no, it's kind of, I want to say no, it's pain without, no gain without pain. But I think like they also got a free ride in essence, right? Like they sure. were lucky that they had these assets and other people wanted to... Um, you know, yeah. buy it from them, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like nothing, nothing is free um, eventually. But yeah, I find it interesting what you said about like, uh, and I agree. I think Bitcoin is a savings technology, right? It's not an investment, and so people, of course, in the media they frame it as an investment. Oh, you can get rich, etc. But it's it's really about not getting poor. In, mm -hmm. You know, so it, 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 it's a savings technology, and it's not an investment. And the fact that people look at it as an investment. Based on what you just said, I think shows us already how far gone we are with the the value of the fiat money, right? The, the entire concept of saving is, well, in my country, that's really like drilled into you, right? Mm -hmm. In the youth. So I think a lot of people still save without actually thinking if that is the right thing to do. So I think in my country, it's the country, one of the highest savings percentages, right? Interesting. But a lot of people, especially younger people, it's all about investing, etc. And so that's become like a thing, right? And and you see eToro and Plus 500 and whatever, you know, like you have all these platforms basically. But it also takes time and you need to study, right? And you're spending your energy and time to figure this out. Well, you know, if you could just save without worrying, you could actually spend your time and energy on, you know, whatever you want to contribute to the world, right? And I think that's, you know, what what Safe Dean obviously talks Absolutely. about a lot with the high and low time preference. Absolutely, but, uh, I think. Yeah, I think on that point, Sailor made the point once that he used the term, like our, our fiat money is like a cattle prod that is constantly prodding people to invest or uh, spend, and um, and that's why we get this sort of malinvestment and malconsumption. So, um, yeah, the. By uh, restoring the concept of savings, we we no longer have to do that. We we have this sort of default position for money as savings, and then and only then do we term do we determine like oh do we have an investment opportunity that we're interested in that we need to take exactly. advantage of, or is there something what that do I, I want need to risk? spend money on? Yeah, right. or do I need to spend money on something? Yeah. But right now, of course, you sort of feel like you have to spend money on something, especially if you live in countries like say um argentina or that that has high inflation or uh, venezuela um you sort of have to get get rid of your money which is which is crazy yeah. and yeah well if you follow the cattle prod idea like it it occupies your mind right For so sure. a third party forces you to create a money and you think okay i'm gonna use the money and as a child you have the money in your hand and you get the bread and you think okay well this is the money Right, but then when you when you grow up and you start to figure out, you know, what am I going to contribute to society? You need some time to figure it out. You know, most people don't know what they are good at, right? But yeah. but you are kind of like robbed of that opportunity to figure that out because once you start earning money and start expanding your lifestyle, or you're moving out of the house, or then you're buying a house, or you get a relationship and a child and a car and a this and a that, like you trap yourself more in this system that keeps you busy with something mm -hmm. that you shouldn't be busy with basically absolutely um, absolutely and, and yeah yeah it's fascinating I, I i i when we talk about this right and we talk through it i'm just so surprised and shocked at the same time that not more people are thinking about this right and that's also why um, you know, I think this this conversation is a very practical conversation, right? But I have a lot yeah. of other conversations that are more about kind of like the spirituality or the, the personal development part, you know, the personal journey of discovering Bitcoin. Because you have to, in some way, like run into this problem that I just described and you have to get to a, maybe just one point where you think like, hmm, you know, what am I, what am, what am I doing, right? And that's kind of the start of hopefully the rabbit hole if you're intellectually cur curious exactly. or actually you know experience the, the 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 problem of fiat money in a real hard way like um i'm i i i i just realized in when i recorded in my uh 
my last podcast with Maya from from Suriname that the people in Suriname who make $180 a month and are on survival mode, they have no time wow. to figure this out. So we are very lucky wow. that, yeah, we, are, that we figured sure. this out, you know? Um, very true. And, and that's also why we need to talk about it more. And so I think you For sure. explained a lot of different touch points, I think, very well. And um, yeah, I think terrific conversation for people to, to check out. I wanted to ask you the last question that I ask everyone. And that is, uh, what is a core belief that you will never let go? Yeah, I think um, maybe there's maybe there's two here, um, especially as they relate to Bitcoin. Um, one is to think from first principles. Um, and I think this naturally comes to Bitcoiners, like we touched on earlier, where we have this intellectual curiosity. It's important to always ask why and why and why. And I think there's a framework out there. I think it's called the five whys framework. And it's very, very useful for really thinking through that. And I think um, that that is very much the kind of mindset that allowed me to discover Bitcoin. And I think it's very important um, for anyone else to discover why Bitcoin is, is important. And maybe another um, um, belief that I that I hold is is around recognizing artificial constructs, which we also touched on earlier is the idea that um, people say dismiss Bitcoin as medium of exchange because they see certain things that are obstacles in the path. But when those obstacles are artificial constructs that can be removed and will be removed, I think by certain gov governments, then the opportunity presents itself. So I think it's important to recognize what are natural obstacles versus artificial obstacles. And just as an example there, there's one from history, I think, um, Andreas Antonopoulos maybe covered it in one of his talks or book, this concept of the red flag law, where um, in England, I think um, in, this, in the early parts of the 19th century, they had, a, or early parts of the 20th century, rather, they had a very significant lead in um, car manufacturing. They had a lot of um, car companies, they had a lot of uh, wonderful entrepreneurs and technology. Uh, but then they brought in this rule where um, somebody had, because there were a number of accidents, uh, somebody had to walk in front of the car with a red flag and wave people away. So, of course, this limited the car's speed and practicality and everything. It was a nightmare. Um, but that was the reason then that um, the industries all moved to the U.S. and the U.S. took over the, the lead in car manufacturing. But that's very much an example of an artificial construct that uh, got in the way. Um, and I, I recommend, you know, just people uh, be be aware of those artificial constructs and make the, the distinction uh, between artificial versus real. Yeah, I love that. Th thanks so much for sharing that. I, I would add to that the uh... The, the fact that they moved to America because they had open arms and then they profited from that, yeah. right? That that's, and, there, There's multiple examples of that in history, right? Absolutely. But and I think that's Bitcoin, what we're going to see. It's the same thing. Yeah. Exactly. We're, it's, Bitcoin is just a wonderful um, opportunity for that jurisdictional competition and game theory because... I think even in the case of that example of like auto manufacturing, there are were, there were probably just a handful of countries where auto manufacturing could have moved to and US was certainly one of them. But in the case of Bitcoin, um, the jurisdictional competition is much broader. It's the whole world. And we will see, start to see more countries um, yeah. just raise their hand and say, hey, we just want to be Bitcoin friendly. Um, and in many cases, what's what's important to note as well is that the country doesn't have to do anything particularly special to become Bitcoin or Bitcoin friendly. They just need to remove the obstacles that are there by default. Things like yeah. um, capital gains tax on Bitcoin or treating Bitcoin as property instead of currency. Um, just a few things like that, just to remove obstacles. It's about removing as opposed to adding new things. Yeah. Well, I think there's never been any country who didn't profit from a technological, uh, from adopting a, a, a technological advance, advancement, right? So, uh, well, Absolutely. anyone listening who uh, leads a country, <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> well, exactly. uh, John, thanks again. I uh, really enjoyed this conversation. And, thanks, um, Bram. Yeah, looking forward to your really new publications. It. And stay in Thank touch. you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. 
And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.